in the lower 48 of the United States, which is California, Oregon, and Washington, they are considered a distinct population segment and are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So within that listed area, um, we know that they have declined over, since listing in 1992. Um, and in the last nine, 10 years, we've been doing a lot of at-sea surveys to document what the declines are. And we've been able to document that we have about a 27% decline over the last decade throughout the range. And we've got about a 45% decline just here in Washington. The Fish and Wildlife Service is um, working to stabilize and increase the population size of merlets by working with researchers and universities. Throughout the range, we work with lots of federal agencies, state agencies, uh, tribes, and private landowners to retain their nesting habitat on the landscape to prevent bee being harvested. We also provide a lot of money and support um, to some of the researchers in helping to identify the causes of the continued decline. We also, through our Section 6 program, put money on the ground in purchasing habitat and putting it into conservation status. We are putting money into corvid research and looking at ways to remove predators from the population areas, as well as doing some taste aversion studies for crows and, and jays in particular. So threats in the terrestrial environment for murrelets uh, primarily is past and ongoing uh, removal of their nesting habitat, and that removal can occur because of harvest for people taking the timber, or from fire, or from wind. They want to have large intact stands without a lot of edge. When they become fragmented, such as you put a timber harvest alongside or take out a portion of it, or you put a road or a trail or something through the middle of it, um, that creates more edge that allows more sunlight into that area. It also allows for wind throw effects when you open up a portion of the canopy through a middle of the stand. Those trees then become more prone to blowing over. We know historically that they were affected by oil spills. We know in the past that they were taken in gill nets, both actively fished gill nets and derelict gear, which is gear that's lost by fishermen that ends up fishing underwater for however long. And with water quality, we have a lot of um, pollution issues here in the Puget Sound in particular. We know from research that was done in uh, California and British Columbia that what birds eat now is different than what they were eating a century ago and that those prey that they're eating now provide a lower caloric value. And this is really important for um, birds in that quality of prey can lead to reproductive success or failure. If the birds are not fit leading up to breeding, they may forego breeding that year and not nest. They may um, not be fit enough to continue through the whole breeding season if they can't deliver the correct number of prey and or the quality of prey that the chick requires before fledging. It may not reach the correct weight and the amount of time that it would need to be able to fledge successfully. What we really anticipate is the greatest threat to the species from climate change is the reaction of prey to the climate change. And differences there we're looking at seeing Sea surface temperature increases. Uh, we're looking at changes in upwelling patterns along the outer coast and looking at changes probably in the ocean stratification, which means different temperatures at different levels. The frequency and the duration of harmful algal blooms is anticipated, in particular in Puget Sound, to increase as a consequence of increasing water temperatures. Some algal blooms produce a toxin that can be picked up in the food web and that gets relayed up the food chain and merlets feed on the things that are eating on those algae blooms. When you get a large bloom, it sucks up all of the oxygen out of the water and that can result in either mortality of their prey species or pushing the prey species far enough away that they may be deeper or farther offshore than a merlet could realistically be able to forage upon them. We're a really long ways from being able to do that or delisting the species. Um, at this point, what I would measure as success is having a stable population without a continuing decline. Establishing our measures of success for recovery, um, to me, is quite a ways down the road yet. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the Marble Murrelet and the Fish and Wildlife Service's conservation efforts. Uh, for more information, you can visit the Fish and Wildlife Service's websites.